right, we're going to review the first third calculus. We started with limits. That was the first actual lesson. And we introduced that notation, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l. It means the function values, the y's, are going to get really close to l as the x's get really, really close to a. We talked about there being two-sided limits. We can look as x approaches a from the right by putting a plus next to the a, to the right of the a. We can do a minus, which means we're approaching a from the left. For the limits as x approaches a to exist, what must be the case? The left hand limit must equal the right hand limit. A situation that would make things visually easy to understand would be the following. Say we have a little piece of a function, f of x, and above one, this hole is at two, and this solid dot is at three. We would say in this case, the limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x is Sorry, one from the left and f of x is one, two, I'm all messed up. Limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x. That's two. Goodness. As I'm approaching x from the left, I'm approaching this value two where the hole is located. If I look at approaching one from the right, it's the same thing. Since it's the same thing, that means the limit as x approaches 1 in general also equals 2. Well, where does this closed circle come into play? That's our function value at 1. That's 3. Okay, there are certain ways that limits do not exist. Whenever your left-hand limit does not equal your right-hand limit. So if you have a situation where you have a jump, limit does not exist at this point. If you have an asymptote and your function values are approaching infinity or negative infinity. Because the left-hand limit is positive infinity, the right-hand limit is negative infinity. They don't equal. Well, here's a question. What if we have a graph like this? What would be the limit as x approaches 0 for this situation? So there's two actual answers. Infinity is a correct answer because from the left you're approaching infinity and from the right you're approaching positive infinity. However, the definition of a limit says we have to approach some value L. L is a value. We know from watching our videos that infinity is not a specific value. You can add one to it and you get infinity. You can add infinity to it, you get infinity. So you could say either this is positive infinity or be careful and just say it does not exist because we're not approaching a specific value. Does not exist. We'll cover it. And you will not make any mistakes. Here's another example of limits. You can ask if the limit, what the limit is as we approach one from the left one from the right, one in general, and we can ask what the function value is at one. 
From the left, we know it's negative 1. From the right, we know it's positive 1. In general, does not exist because the left-hand limit does not equal the right-hand limit. And we know the function value at 1 is 0. Cool? So that was the introduction to limits. And we talked about limits at infinity. So this is what a limit at infinity looks like as x approaches infinity. This is how we found our horizontal asymptotes. Okay, we see where our function is trending as we get bigger and bigger uh, for our x's, and smaller and smaller for our x's. So if you're asked, really, if you want to find your horizontal asymptotes, two things you have to do. It's not just look at the limit as x approaches infinity. You have to evaluate the limit as x approaches both positive infinity, and you have to look at the limit as x approaches negative infinity of whatever your function is. Now there are rules for limits at infinity that we can follow. And these are all as x approaches negative infinity. We got 3x squared over 2x, we got 3x over 2x squared, we got 3x squared over 2x squared. <laughs> Just using negative for a reason. It could be negative or positive. Okay. When we have limits at infinity, we look at the degree. If your largest degree term is in the numerator. Now, it does not have to be just like 3x squared. It could be 3x squared plus x. This x would not mean anything. I could put plus 100. This 100 would not do anything. The 3x squared would dominate what would happen in our numerator, and the rest would be just insignificant. So if the degree is bigger in the top, The numerator is going to grow faster than the denominator because x squared goes faster than x. doesn't matter what comes before x squared or comes before x. The x squared will dominate it. That means the numerator is growing faster. The fraction will get bigger and bigger and bigger since the numerator will continue to get larger and larger and larger away from the denominator. So this, in general, could approach positive or negative infinity. The question is which one? So this is where we have to be careful. Some situations we assume it's just going to approach infinity because the top is going faster than the bottom. But since I have this negative infinity, I have to do a sign test. I plug in a negative value in for x and I square it. It becomes positive. Multiplied by 3, it stays positive. Plug in a negative value into our denominator, multiply by 2, it stays negative. That's why this one up here is negative infinity. So don't forget about doing those sign tests. If the degree is bigger in the denominator,
That means the denominator will be growing faster than the numerator. That means the fraction overall will get closer and closer to what? Zero is correct. We don't have to worry about a sign test because it's going to be zero. If the degrees are the same, what do we look at? The numerator is growing at the same speed as the denominator. What will we be trending towards as we approach infinity or negative infinity? The coefficients. of your highest degree terms. In this case, it would be three halves. You can check your sides, but they would pretty much cancel each other out if it was cubed or squared or whatever. Now, question. Would they still cancel out if it was like an x cubed plus x squared? So, if we had, say, something that was a limit as x approaches infinity of x cubed plus 3x squared plus 50x over x cubed plus 10x squared plus 12x, what would this limit be? One is correct. Why? Because as we continue to grow faster and faster and faster, this stuff, even though there's a lot of it, just doesn't really matter. It will become less and less significant as x's get bigger and bigger and bigger. This will dominate our function. This will trend towards 1. So even if the numerator had x squared and all that, and the denominator only had x squared, it would Yep. That will dominate things. Now, what is interesting we need to bring up is the comparison between, say, like 5 to the x. Nice find. And something like x to the fifth or x to the 20th. Which one would we consider to be a bigger degree? The x to the, uh, the, x to the 20th or the 5 to the x? 5 to the x would be the greater degree. This would actually be the biggest degree. If you have an x and an exponent, then boom, you're going to look at the coefficients for this. Now, it's kind of tough. If you have some deal like this, What would that be? It would just be negative 1. That's exactly right. If I change this to 2 to the x, what would the limit be? No. This would grow faster than this. So much so that as x's get bigger, this will trend to infinity. So this is the biggest degree, but guess what? That is less than 10 to the x. Because it's 10 to different powers. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Relative to 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. So you can look at the base once you turn the exponent into a variable. Well, I mean, what if I flip these up? What if I made this? What if I made the denominator 5 to the x and made the numerator 2 to the x? Make this 2 to the x and make this 5 to the x. What would that be? 
They're both going to infinity, right? But what's growing faster, the numerator or the denominator? The denominator. If the denominator is going faster than the numerator, what's this approaching? Zero, not negative infinity. Okay. Okay? So, what's interesting, though, is that these react differently when we have variables in the, in the exponent form. They react differently than, like, x squared. Let me show you an example. We'll have e to the x, and I'll compare it to x squared as we approach infinity. Then I'll have e to the x, and I'll compare this to negative x squared, or just positive x squared as x approaches negative infinity. All right, Mr. Ty, limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x is what? If I plug in big numbers in for x, what happens to this? Is it going to grow? Is it going to go to zero? It's going to grow. Good. Just infinity. Or does not exist, of course. Mr. Valdez, same with x squared. If I plug in bigger numbers for x and square it, what is this going to approach? All right. Let's look at x squared if I plug in negative infinity. Uh, Mr. Acosta, what does that approach? Yeah, positive infinity. It could be positive or negative infinity, but since we're squaring it, it would be positive infinity. So that makes us think that this is going to be positive infinity, right? But what is it? It's zero. Why is it zero? Because you plug in e to the negative infinity, and sure, that's going to grow, but a negative exponent is like 1 over e to the positive exponent. This is a very, very crucial thing to remember come AP practice test and AP actual test. Variables and exponents react differently than variables not in exponents. Okay, finding limits analytically. Remember, if we have limits at numbers, and even if we do it with infinities, we can start by plugging in the numbers or plugging in the infinities. If you get a number out, well, that means your function is defined at that number. That means that's got to be the limit. However, most of the times with problems like these, and this is what we dealt with uh, at the beginning, we get indeterminate form. So 0 over 0, we don't know what that is. Infinity over infinity, we don't know what that is. If we get that, it doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. does not. It might mean we have a hole in our function. And we know that holes in functions have limits because we're going to be approaching the same point from either side of the hole. So what do we have to do, say, for this one? When I plug in 0, I get 0 over 0. That doesn't mean the limit does not exist. Instead, I have to algebraically manipulate that function and maybe get rid of the hole and come up with a new function that will fill in the hole and help me find out what that limit is. So if you got that, you got to algebraically manipulate it. You remember what we did. We factored. We multiplied by conjugates. We found common denominators. All those fancy-dancy algebraic things we learned at the beginning of the year. Okay, so limit does, the, we think the limit does not exist here because we get 0 over 0, but we're wrong. Instead, what we can do is factor out, say, an x cubed from all of these terms. When stuff cancels, we have a new function that fills in the hole, which we can 
then plug in zero into to find out where that hole was located. I plug in zero, I get six over negative five. Second one is the same deal. We can have as x approaches two. If I plug in two into x squared minus four and x minus two, I get zero over zero. Does not mean the limit does not exist. Instead, attempt to algebraic, uh, algebraically manipulate it to create a new function, a function that's going to be considered like the dominating function to help you see what the function is going to look like, and then plug it in because most likely what you did eliminated the hole that prevented you to plug it in in the first place. Four. Okay, so after we talked about limits, do I want to do continuity first? No. After we talked about limits, we brought up the definition of a derivative. The derivative is a fancy math word for what? The slope of a function at a point or the slope of a tangent line. Okay, we said, okay, in this first half of class, we're going to focus on these derivatives, these slopes of tangents. They're going to help us solve problems. We're going to do some crazy problems with them, help us analyze functions, et cetera, et cetera. But it all started with, well, how do I find a slope? Well, the average rate of change is what I can consider like an average slope. We found that the slope of any two points is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. That's the average rate of change of something. That comes from your y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 slope formula. Well, then we said, well, what if we took these two points and made them infinitely close to each other so that they're pretty much on top of each other? Well, what happens is we have a situation where, say, two points here and here give us this slope. If we put them on top of each other, all of a sudden, we get that tangent slope. How do we do that? How do we find this instantaneous rate of change, which is a derivative? We took the slope by taking the limits as h, which we considered a distance, approach zero. So that means the distance between these two points was close to zero. How we talked about the two points was we said the first point is a function value with that distance away from my original function value here. I subtracted my function value at that point and I divided it by my distance, my x distance, which was an h. Okay, so average rate of change gives you the slope of a secant. Secant just means it passes through two points, obviously, on a function. Instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent. Now, the tangent line might pass through the function a couple times, but still, that is the instantaneous rate of change. Now, we figured out how to evaluate tangents using this formula, but you don't have to do that in the future. 
instead, if you give a if you get a problem like this, you need to know what this means. If I have the limit as h approaches zero of log of x plus h minus log of x all over h, you should know that this is just a fancy dancy way of saying what is the derivative of log x. Why log x? Because that's my function. Why is it the derivative? Because it's in the definition of a derivative. We're trying to find the slope at any point of log x. And we know that the derivative of log x is 1 over x. And that would be your answer. Same with something like this. You can see x plus h cubed minus x cubed. And you'd be asked this on your AP test. This does not mean you have to cube x plus h and simplify it, find a common denominator, get rid of an h. Instead, you should know that this just means take the derivative of x cubed, which you know is 3x squared. If it's like x plus h cubed plus x cubed, would it be the derivative of the negative? Um, it would have to be a negative here if this is positive. And then that would be negative. That'd be negative. Yes? If h was not approaching zero, this is a good question. If h is approaching one, what should we do? Plug in 1. You get x plus 1 cubed plus x cubed over 1. It's that simple. You won't see something like that. That would be too tricky. You will see something where they plug in numbers in for uh, x. Uh, so the limit as h approaches 0 of, let's do something like the log of 4 plus h minus the log of 4 all over h. You need to, for your exam, see this, understand they are asking us to find the derivative of log x when x equals 4, know that the derivative of log x is 1 over x. Plugging in 4, you get 1 over 4. Okay? So, we talked about, hey, now we're going to talk about tangent lines. Well, not always will we have tangent lines. And this is when we start talking about continuities, being continuous. And then we started talking about if we're differentiable, what it means to be differentiable. So let's talk about being continuous. Functions continuous if there are no holes or vertical asymptotes. If it's just a smooth curve or straight line, you're continuous. To check for continuity, you have to check that the left-hand limit is equal to the right-hand limit, which is equal to the function value. Okay? And this is what this says. If you have a hole you're not continuous. If you have a vertical asymptote, you're not continuous. But the key is, you got to know which ones are removable, which means the limit exists, and which ones are not removable. Removable are holes. Okay? We have holes when our function can be simplified and the hole goes away. Do 
example, you look at x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. Since I can simplify this to be x plus 2, x minus 2, x equals 2 is a whole for the original function. Non-removable would be something like an asymptote. Or you can't simplify. If I have x plus 4 over x minus 2, x equals 2 would be a vertical asymptote. And the holes or something like that, asymptote, something like that. They are both discontinuities. Even if I can simplify and this 2 goes away, this 2 is still a discontinuity, even though it disappears. A lot of people messed up on that when we took our test. He said, oh, this went away, so we are continuous at that point. Not true. Let's talk about being differentiable. A function is differentiable if it is continuous and if the left-hand derivative or the slopes of the tangents to the left of my point equal or approach the slopes of my tangents from the right of my point, which is equal to the actual derivative at the point. Okay? So, that means the left-hand derivative equals the right-hand derivative, which equals the slope at that value. That means the slopes on the left. Wake up, Mr. Bealy. Equal the slopes on the right. Which equals the slope at the point. This usually occurs, no problem. When it doesn't occur is when you have a cusp, a sharp point. Or when you're not continuous and you have a hole. So, example of a cusp is when we have this. We are not continuous here. We're not differentiable here. A sharp point, an absolute value. We are not differentiable here. We are not continuous. Even though the left-hand derivatives will equal the right-hand derivatives at this point, this is not continuous, so it's not differentiable. Differentiability implies Continuity. If in a question you says this, if a question says that this function is differentiable, you can assume it's continuous. However, if a question states that this function is continuous, you cannot assume it's differentiable. Very, very key concept to understand. see a lot of questions where they'll state just something. The question states that f of x is differentiable. You can definitely assume it's continuous. Not the other way around. In your packet, 
Let's do problems one. Go. Do number one. Let's all do it together. Check your answer with your neighbor once you get it done. Everybody have a packet? We'll start with number one. You guys have the evens from 2 to 40 for homework over the next two nights. They will take a while. And it, it will take a while, yes. And I don't want you to be discouraged to just start circling answers. Try your best. Understand, though, that these problems are a little bit harder than the actual problems you will see. So don't get discouraged and just give up. Number one is not, is not harder. Number one is, is, should be a standard problem we can do. Same with number two. We'll get to some more. Number three is, is a piece of cake. Number five, maybe, maybe not. Check your answer with the neighbor once you get it. Everybody get negative eight ninths. All right, do number three. Number three is an easy one. Not crazy. This first section is easy. Nope, skip number two. We're just going to do some odds. <coughs> What do we get for three, Mr. Buley? So why do you say that three is false? Well, that would be true if this says f of one exists. f of one does not exist, but the limit does exist. Because the limit from the left is three, the limit from the right is three, so that means the limit at one is three. They all exist. They're all true. Common mistake. Don't worry about the holes. That means the function value doesn't exist, but the limit exists at holes. We get examples like that. No. Some people put orange zest on like desserts and stuff in fancy dancy restaurants. Okay, number five. Number five. Number five. Number five. I'll tell you right now, the answer is not D or E. Remember, when you plug in A and you get 0 over 0, you need to try to algebraically manipulate. <coughs> Anybody get it? Next hint is that you have to factor the denominator. Thank you. 
Anybody get? Kobe, what'd you get? B is correct. How do you get B? Well, you need to recognize that if you have like a difference of squares, that's like x squared minus 3 squared. You can make it look like x plus 3 times x minus 3. Well, look at this x to the 2n. We know using our products of exponents, you can look, that, look at that like x to the n squared. So we have x to the n squared minus a to the n squared. As long as we have squares, whatever is inside the parentheses can look like x uh, or will be the two terms that we'll put in the plus and then the minus. So this will be x to the n plus a to the n times x to the n minus a to the n. And then up top we have x to the n minus a to the n, which will cancel with that other one. Question. <laughs> sure. I don't think that would work. But then you'd have to notice, like, you would still have to factor, right? But you can use numbers to factor. Yeah, I like it. Go for it. Pick some numbers. Maybe it'll be easier to see. When you plug in a for x, you get a to the n plus a to the n. Well, that's 2 a to the n. But yeah, pick a couple numbers. Pick, uh, pick 2 for a, pick 3 for n. I would stay away from numbers like 1, like 0. Um, negative numbers could confuse you, so stay with that. All right, do number six. Number six is a great problem. It is a homework problem, but we'll do it right now. What do you have to do, Mr. Ty, if you're asked to find the horizontal asymptotes? Mr. Acosta, did you write it down? Find the limits at positive and negative infinity. That's how you find horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are like, what are your functions trending towards? Okay, this is a horizontal asymptote. My function's trending towards this value. I look at what my function is approaching as x is approaching infinity and negative infinity. So do that.
Who thinks they have it? Mr. Manis, what do you got? Did you find any of them? Good. That is correct. That's the limit as x approaches infinity. Why'd you choose negative three and not like positive three? Exactly. You look at the coefficients, which is correct. Three over negative one. The degrees are the same in the numerator and the denominator. So negative three is our first horizontal asymptote. Did anybody find another one? Ms. Sloan? Exactly. Y equals 2 would be the other one. How do I know that? Because I'm plugging in negative infinity for x. And we talked about, and I made sure you guys wrote it down, most of you, e to the negative infinity is like 0. So that's like 6 plus 0 over 3 minus 0. That's just 2. All right, let's do number seven. Mr. Perkins, you get it? It would just be cosine, but it would be cosine x when x equals pi. It would be the derivative of sine, but when x equals pi. Negative one. Okay, real quickly, look at this. This is another way of writing down the definition of a derivative. This is the same thing as this, only it's two points, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, but it's instead of b, it's x, and it's as x approaches a. That's like your two points are practically on top of each other the same thing as this. This is two points practically on top of each other defining the slope. Just a function value minus another function value over, a function va uh, over an x minus another x. So you could see it like this. You might want to write that down. I don't see it often. I see it mostly like this, asking questions. But who knows? Sometimes it pops up. Well, let's do 10. Number nine, well, we can't do just yet because you don't remember how to take the derivative of inverse tangent. Yeah. It was. It's the derivative of sine of x when x is pi. It's like... If I ask you to, if, yes, exactly. If I ask you, like, what is, you know, the derivative of this at 3, you're not going to plug in 3 in for x first and then take the derivative and have it equal 0. Right? You are going to take this first and then plug in 3, and you get 18. Right? So it's all about getting the function first, finding the derivative, then plugging in the value. Okay, so we're looking at 10. 
Ten's tricky, right? Look at E and D. This is the derivative of your function at your x value equals a number. Well, what's the derivative of your function? That's just the slope of your function at that specific x value. Also read the question, which of the following statements about f is false? False is the key word. Look at D. This is the derivative of my function at 2 equals negative 1. When I look at 2, the slope at 2, since it's a straight line, is negative 1. This is true. Since it's true, it's not one of our answers. You can use that same kind of thought process to look at E and to look at B. A and C are a little bit different. But at least look at E, D. Uh, e, e and B. Still, is E true or false? E is true. If you look at 1, we have a sharp point. That means the derivative does not exist. Eliminate that. Mr. Bewley, look at B. Is B true or false? So, it, this states the derivative of my function at 0 is 0. Is the derivative of my function at 0, 0? No. That's your answer. Typically, you will have a couple answer choices on an, a multiple choice question, probably one, that's going to look crazy. You're going to be wanting to probably select your crazy one, like C. You're probably like, oh, I don't know what that is. That's got to be the answer. It's usually not going to be that one. So usually throw that out just to really make it tough. Um, here for C, this is a point at some distance away from zero minus a point at some distance to the left of zero. Well, let's think about that. This is a zero plus h. This over here is zero minus the same h. Here's the point that is generated at that. Okay, and it doesn't matter what h is, the two points would be kind of next to each other. Well, 2h is the distance in h from here to here. What is the slope of this line? And the slope is 0. So that's why this one is true, because the slope between these two points that are to the right and to the left is 0, since this curve is symmetric, is 0. A is just like direct substitution. I could plug in 0 for f of x. f of 0 is 0. The limit as x approaches 0 of f of 0 is also 0. 0 minus 0 is 0. So that's fun. It's true as well. Okay? Okay, let's jump to 39. Yeah, 39.
What do you think, Miss Gudis? Yep. So one and two. See, good. Forty-one. Forty-one stuff. Because of this guy up top. Which of the following statements about f are not true? It has a limit. It's continuous. It's differentiable. The derivative of f prime is continuous when x equals one. Well, let's find part one. Does it have a limit? If I'm looking at the limit, am I going to look at the top part, which is when x doesn't equal 1, or the bottom part? The bottom will just be my function value. If I want to find my limit, I need to find the function values we're approaching as we get close to 1, but not equal to 1. So we actually look at the top piece when x does not equal 1. I plug in 1, I get 0 over 0 does not necessarily mean, or probably definitely doesn't mean, my function, uh, my limit is, does not exist. Instead, I need to factor this. Now, this one's tricky because it's a difference of cubes. I'll go ahead and factor it for you. Same opposite, always positive. All right, now you tell me what the limit is and if it has a limit. Does it have a limit, Miss Elliott? Um, no. Does the one goes away? I can plug in one. One squared plus one plus one is three. The limit exists. The limit equals three. That's true. Part two: Are we continuous? Well, let's see. The limit as x approaches one is three. Is f of one three? There is a hole if we just look at this top piece. But we have an extra piece down here. f of 1 is 3. So we fill in the hole. We're continuous. And then it wouldn't be continuous. But it's not a jump. We have a hole, and it gets filled in. And what you'll notice, uh, Ms. Sloan, this x squared plus x plus 1 that is what this function looks like. It looks like x squared plus x plus 1. Only this function will have a hole at 1, 3. It'll still look like x squared plus x plus 1. Part 3, are we differentiable? That means the derivative on the left needs to equal the derivative on the right, which needs to equal the derivative at the point. So. I'm going to go ahead and just like work with this guy. This will determine the derivative on my left and on my right because it'll be what my function really looks like everywhere except for when x equals 1. So f prime when x does not equal 1 is equal to 2x plus 1. What is f prime when x equals 1? Just 3. It's the derivative of 3x. Now, does the derivative of this equal the derivative from the left and the derivative from the right? Yes, if I get closer and closer to 1 for my x, 2 plus 1 gets me 3. So if I plugged in 0.999, I'll be approaching 3. If I plug in 1.001, I'll be approaching 3. So the derivative is 3 at 1, and we are differentiable at 1.
Plus for continuous, I took care of that part. The last statement for the derivative of f prime is continuous. So what's the derivative of f prime? f double prime. We have two pieces, when x does not equal 1 and when x equals 1. What is f double prime when x does not equal 1? 2, which is the derivative of f prime. What's the derivative when x equals 1? 0. Would this function, the second derivative, be continuous? No. Why? Because we're at 2 until we get to 1, and then we have 0 at 1, and then we're back to being at 2. So this is not true. Before we move on until the last kind of third of the notes, look at all this. Okay? Typically, for all these problems, these multiple choice problems, you're going to have a lot of stuff that you need to write down. And there needs to be a lot of work to go into your answers. You're used to multiple choice, especially for these like big kind of comprehensive things being just like look at it, know it, circle the answer. It's not going to be the case for these. If you are circling without writing stuff down, you're not, you're not going to get them right. There's got to be work involved. There's got to be lots of calculations involved. So don't, don't get into the state of C circle. Get in the state of C, figure out what you can do, try to do some stuff, see if you can then really come up with the answer. The answer should be obvious and it should be exact. Now, of course, this problem right here, I would say this one is definitely above the level of the AP exam. Okay? How much? You know, a little bit. I would say that this x cubed minus 1 would probably be an x squared minus 1. I would say that, you know, maybe these options, there are too many. Maybe it would just be 1, 2, or 3. I'm not sure. But it's... All of these problems, most of these problems will involve a lot of work like that, where you're checking and rechecking and going from there. Don't just look and get the answers. Okay, moving on quickly. Derivative rules. Don't forget to use your calculator to find derivatives if you can. If you want to take the derivative of, say, log x e to the x when x is 2, you'd like type in and derive of log x e to the x with respect to x when x equals 2, and you get your answer. Remember that if you do find an f prime, this is a slope generator. So if my function was 3x squared, f prime of x, which is 6x, plugging in x would generate the slopes of f of x. Okay? Quick ones. Derivative of a constant is what? Zero. Derivative of a number in front of x. Just a number. That goes for a number in front of any function. It would just be the number times the derivative of the function. The power rule. What's the derivative of this, Mr. Bewley? I hate that seat over there for you. Product rule. Take the derivative of f times g. If you learned it from me and not from your book or from a tutor, you learn it f prime g plus g prime f. Of 
kosher rule. You learn it from me and not from another teacher. You got F over G. You learn it as F prime G minus G prime F. All over G squared. And finally, the chain rule. You learn as a composition of functions when you take the derivative of it. You get f prime, derivative of the outside, leave the inside, times the derivative of the inside. Quickly do an example of the chain rule. I could have something like sine cubed of 3x squared plus 2x. This is a composition of three functions. We first need to know that sine cubed is the same as sine of whatever all cubed. So to take the derivative of this, you start with the outermost function, which is an x cubed. So take the derivative of the outside, you have 3 sine of, you can even put this all in parentheses, squared, times the derivative of the next piece, which is the sine, leave the inside alone, followed up finally by the derivative of the innermost piece. Do you have to simplify? Maybe, depending on if it's a multiple choice question or not. If it is a multiple choice question, you might have to simplify to see the answer choice that they give you. So be prepared for that. Those derivative rules. Don't forget tangent lines and linear approximations. All you need for a tangent line is the equation. That's the equation of a straight line, which will be an equation of a tangent line. Tangent lines are always straight. Well, lines are always straight. So what you need, you need the points, and you need the slope. So f of x is equal to 4x cubed. And they ask is, what is the tangent line? And x equals 1, well, I need f of 1, which is equal to 4, and I need f prime at 1. y minus 4 is equal to 12 x minus 1. You use that for approximations. You can plug in 1.1, and that'll give you a reasonable estimation for what your function is for x cubed when x is 1.1. Do that real quick. Y minus 4 is equal to 12 times 1.1 minus 1. I get y minus 4 is equal to 1.2, y equals 5.2, should be a good approximation. Almost done. Special derivatives. Derivative of all the x is 1 over x. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of the number to the x is the number to the x. Log the number. The derivative of inverse sine is 1 over root 1 minus x squared. Remember that one? Nope. Derivative of insert inverse cosine is negative 1 over 1 over root 1 minus x squared. And finally, the derivative of inverse cosine uh, sorry, inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus 
x squared. No square roots. Implicit differentiation. Remember the derivative with respect to x of y is dy dx. Do not forget when you're doing implicit differentiation to solve for dy dx. You would take the derivative of the entire side, get 2x plus 2y dy dx is equal to 0, solve for dy dx. And of course, don't forget the product rule when you're encountering an x times a y. The derivative of this is f prime g plus g prime f. The very end of it is right now, online. Yep. Am I okay to come into Friday during second period? I had that whole second period call. Is there somebody that might come in or like you can just have someone talk to it for me? No, I'll be doing another cap class. Okay. Come in before school two days in a row. Or after school one day. I know how many you got wrong. And we forgot about inverse derivatives. I didn't no. set the curve yet. Inverse derivatives. F inverse prime of x is equal to 1 over F prime of F inverse of x. It's up to you. Typically, we say F inverse of x is equal to some missing number. I take F of both sides. I get x is equal to f of that missing number. You can either guess and check to find that number, or you can, or you're probably given that number in the question. All right, do your homework. Two to four, even.